I'm very pleased to have this, this session to, to discuss things with you and, and learn from you as well. And I hope that uh, I can share something of what we've done and it will be of interest. Um, I thought that uh, for those of you who, who are Twitterers and tweeters and other, other things, um, and I know that uh, somebody apparently has been tweeting during the uh, conference today, um, if you want to kind of make comments on what I'm, uh, things that I'm talking about, ask questions either to be dealt with at the end of this uh, short session or for me to uh, kind of deal with um, a little bit later, then you can uh, Twitter away with the hashtag uh, OLCork, unless you have another one already set up that I don't know about. Um, or you can go to today's meet, which is a nice private thing for those of you who've got tablets and, and uh, mobile phones and... Uh, Again, go to today's meet, O.L. Cork, and uh, if we get the chance, we'll have a quick look at the end as to anything that's been said. And if you all burst out laughing halfway through my presentation, I'll know for sure that uh, somebody's just tweeted something interesting and funny <laughs> rather than anything I've said, I guess. Okay, I'm from the University of Scotland. Um, uh, not originally, as we've already heard, but uh, here we are, beautiful campus, sun always shines, uh, just, like in gold, uh, just like in Cork, I'm sure. Um, and uh, particularly from the Institute of Aquaculture, and uh, my one slide on aquaculture, just to introduce it very briefly, um, almost half of the fish that, uh, and seafood that you eat now, and certainly that the world eats, comes from aquaculture, one sort or another. Um, contrary to a lot of popular conceptions, very little of it is actually salmon. Most of it is freshwater fish and uh, bivalves, and 80% uh, of it's all produced in Asia. Um, and it's the fastest growing animal food sector uh, in the world, and one of the largest uh, of the uh, food commodities, uh, internationally traded <coughs> food commodities. Um, so it's a very exciting area to be in, very rapidly growing, and um, that's the end of the advert for the subject area. <laughs> so I'm now going to talk about um, uh, online education and particularly um, experiences of it uh, through Stirling and some of the other activities that I've been involved with on, in a European level, uh, and indeed with Cork and uh, with Gavin. Um, okay, so uh, this is what I kind of feel like at the moment. We're on a journey, and I entitled it a progress report or an interim report because um, we're certainly not there yet. And I think I've got that sense as well from um, some of the discussions this morning that we're kind of all exploring this area and trying to uh, find our way in it. So we're not really quite sure where we're going. Um, the route, there can be many different routes that we take. Um, and, of course, there are many of us all seeking our way. Um, so really my agenda is to sort of see if I can plot a little bit through this, uh, through this sort of concrete jungle, a little bit where we are coming from and uh, what we've been doing over the last 10 years, perhaps. Uh, where are we now, the kind of things that we're doing at the moment, and a little bit on where we might go in the future. Um, Online education. I think that when the internet got going, um, what a lot of us sort of perceived as a great opportunity really was to the whole idea of distance education. Uh, we could put it online and we could do it more cheaply, more effectively and quicker by using the internet. And so we had this kind of model, which was the, the model of um, distance education. And we tried to emulate that to some extent through our online media. So we worked out what the learning needs were, um, how we were going to uh, deliver the learning outcomes, how we were going to assess that, etc. Um, then we'd write all the materials, uh, upload them to our developing learning management systems or virtual learning environments, um, deliver the course uh, from our central location out to all the um, uh, different people taking part in our e-learning courses. Um, and get them sort of involved in that, and then hopefully they would uh, all graduate happily, and uh, everybody would be would be very happy. Um, unfortunately, as with a lot of sort of DIY type approaches, it's never quite as easy uh, as the theory makes it sound. Um, and uh, 
it's a little more complicated than, than going through that kind of process, I think, a lot of us found. Um, and very quickly, as you start to get into it more, you get into the complexities of uh, pedagogy. Um, and I kind of love to get into pedagogy and uh, its complexities. And um, you know, I would very much like to learn more. But uh, time is limited. And I know that a lot of you also, like me, are not um, experts in education. So um, a, a short story to say where I'm coming from, really. Um, I, you probably heard it already, but um, uh, there was an incident where um, Bill Clinton went to visit Jamie Oliver's uh, restaurant in London and um, with his, uh, his entourage. And uh, as you know, Jamie Oliver will be well known for his uh, exceedingly exquisite fine cuisine. Um, and uh, when uh, the Americans arrived, the key, what they, they said was, uh, OK, well, ne never mind all this, uh, this menu, this sort of fancy menu stuff. We want some burgers, please. And um, Jamie Oliver went off in a huff and, uh, uh, and left the premises because he was so upset by this request. So I feel a bit like that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm being a, a Philistine, really, by not getting into the, uh, the details of pedagogy. But um, I'm going to work with a very simplified basic menu, uh, which I hope uh, will nevertheless, in the time available, be useful to everybody. So um, as I say, we had a few, uh, let's say, less than ideal experiences with early e-learning and distance learning. Um, and so a number of questions kind of came to the fore. Um, how do we develop uh, practical aspects to e-learning as well as um, the, the more theoretical side? Um, we found that uh, people engaging in, in uh, e-learning were often adults who were coming with very professional interests. They um, had their sort of agendas of what they wanted to learn, which was not always exactly what you were delivering. Um, and uh, impatient sometimes for um, you know, what, what they wanted to know about. Uh, then there was the problem that uh, they were often doing other jobs at the same time, and so they were finding it hard to get the time to uh, participate in the courses, and so it's often hard to get courses to gel properly, uh, especially if you've got smaller numbers. Um, and if you look actually at what goes on in the classroom experience, on the campus experience, um, a, a lot of it is actually to do with the interaction between the students themselves and the, uh, let's say, out of session interactions with the tutors and other people. Um, it's all the kind of stimulation that goes on uh, outside of the, of the very strict learning activities, which are the organised learning activities. Um, and so people find that distance education is a very isolating experience. Um, so what do we do next? Well, the short answer, I'm afraid, is we cheated. Um, so we, we set up this course in, uh, on distance education, online learning, uh, with the University of, sorry, the Bangladesh Ag Agricultural University in Maimon Singh um, for uh, professionals in the sphere of aquatic resources management, fisheries officers uh, and people. And um, setting it up in this way meant that most of it was run from Stirling, but with uh, Bangladesh tutors involved in the online courses as well. But we also had, uh, as the Open University does, a summer school um, each year where we, we got the students together and we could do practical work, uh, we could do the exams uh, and we could get them set up for the distance education. Um, and in a sense this is cheating because um, it meant that they met each other, they got to know each other and they started to build that community which is, which is so important to a successful course and it got around some of the problems uh, of not being able to do practical work so easily. Although we did actually uh, in addition to providing them with the sort of online materials uh, and the online discussions uh, and everything, we also provided them with uh, digital cameras and uh, laptop computers, microscopes, water quality test kits, so they could actually um, do a certain amount of practical work uh, uh, themselves in their own location. Um, 
And this, this uh, project worked quite well. And I think it worked well because um, the students were all doing the same kind of work. And they, as part of this project, we were trying to get them to um, take their work experiences and bring it into the, the academic sphere, the study sphere as well. And the fact that they, they were so kind of, um, uh, in a sense, focused on uh, a particular country, a particular kind of um, job, uh, particular kinds of issues, it was grounded in what they were, were doing. Um, <clears throat> it was more successful than some of the other e-learning courses that we've, we've uh, run in the past. Um, you know, another thing that uh, I've kind of been trying out myself in my master's course teaching over the uh, last couple of years, um, we've kind of got this concept that uh, e-learning is all about taking the university out into the, into the world and delivering our education out there. Um, well, what about turning it the other way around and saying, here is a, is, a, is a golden opportunity to bring the world, bring all these other experiences and, and expertise into our classrooms. Um, so here, uh, two things really. One was to get you know, leading experts from industry or from other research institutes, get them into the classroom using, sim simply using Skype video conferencing. Um, and the students sort of respond to this very well, because if we're doing um, some discussions about, let's say, how, how do we manage a recirculating aquaculture system, a certain type of aquaculture system, um, we can get somebody in who's actually doing that in practice, you know, one of the largest um, installations in the UK, for instance, talking directly to the students about the uh, problems uh, that they have and how they're dealing with them. And that kind of uh, engagement with industry um, really kind of sets, sets things alight much more than, um, you know, showing them slides, giving them uh, kind of second-hand talks. Um, another thing we did was to um, link them up with a group of, this is a, a group of um, aquaculture students in Stirling, a small group, uh, who were doing um, our unit in aquaculture business management link them up with a group of MBA students in America um, who are obviously much more experienced in terms of the business side of things, but they were looking at aquaculture as a potential business model. Um, and so there was some very interesting interaction going on there where uh, the business people were able to sort of talk about their, their view of aquaculture uh, and the aquaculturists were able to kind of express their views. And... Um, uh, that again was a, was was very valuable, and it was something that was facilitated very easily. Again, just just using Skype and, and email and things. So, the fact that we can kind of bring in uh, external things um, into the classroom, I think, is an important uh, concept. And we tried to follow that up a little bit with the um, uh, Aqua T Net network. This is an Erasmus network in the aquaculture sector, and. Um, want to encourage the industry themselves to say, hey, we've got things that we could share with uh, academia and hopefully we can kind of build uh, up these connections and make it easier uh, for this kind of activity to take place. Um, okay, so, so getting into this, what what's, comes more to the fore is it, um, it's all about kind of, um, you know, getting people's imaginations going, getting the motivation going, um, getting people incentivized uh, to learn. Um, how do we do that more effectively? Um, and that kind of leads on to this uh, Aquaculture Talent Vocational Aqualabs project, um, which we did uh, just very recently. Uh, EC uh, funded through the Leonardo da Vinci project and um, in partnership uh, with Cork. And... Um, uh, yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I'm going to hand over now to, to my colleague who will tell you a little bit more about it. Well, thank you, John, for that introduction. I would like to talk to you a little bit about the Vocational Aqualabs Aquaculture Talent Hatchery uh, course, which aims to provide training to early stage researchers in entrepreneurship and innovation processes. It used blended learning and a simulation game as teaching methods. Participants were organised into four teams from the UK, Greece, Spain and Ireland and were challenged to develop a business plan for a new innovation. 
They had six weeks for this, during which time they were supported by both a tutor and a mentor from industry. The course started with two days of inputs from various academic and industrial experts, most in the form of presentations in Stirling, which were web streams to other students. Recordings of these inputs could also be edited and uploaded to the learning management system which are used for the course, based on Moodle. I'm just going to fade it a little bit and uh, talk over it, principally because um, we were talking this morning about problems with Camtasia, and I had problems with Camtasia when I was producing this, and so the, the, the audio went wrong, and I'm going to just talk a little bit over it. But um, you can see that was uh, the original video, and then this is uh, how it looked when it was web-streamed over um, this system called the Big Blue Button, uh, which is an a open-source uh, virtual classroom. Um, and this is using the same package, uh, this time when we were introducing the mentors. Now, one of the key things about this project was that we, uh, also, we had the teams, but we also allocated an industry mentor to each of the teams to work with them. So the, stu the students um, knew that they had an industry expert working with them. So firstly, they had the actual challenge of a competition, which was a good motivator. Uh, and then they had people from industry working with them. Um, this was another example of uh, one of the tutors at Stirling delivering uh, his, his uh, input through, uh, through the big blue button. So uh, there's various um, systems like this. Um, this one, I will turn the audio up very quickly here because this is uh, just purely using the big blue button for a, a presentation which I think was probably more effective, actually, than web streaming from the classroom. But gestures are really very important. This was an input on how to make a good presentation, which I definitely need to watch. So you can see here that uh, people attending are listed up. And then there's a, a chat area so people can ask questions um, and have some discussions without getting involved in the audio. Okay, this was um, just an example of uh, people aren't being able to ask questions. One issue we found with this system, if you, if you go for it, is that um, uh, you get a lot of feedback if people use loudspeakers rather than headphones. So it's quite important to get everybody to use headsets, uh, otherwise you start getting kind of loop going around and difficult to follow. Um, but you can also use the, um, the discussion, the chat section here to ask questions, and people can... Uh, raise their hands uh, virtually if they want to ask, ask something. Um, and so at the end of the six weeks when they put their business plans together uh, they presented their uh, business plans in front of an audience and also in front of um, a set of senior judges from the industry. Um, and then there was a final 
the team that won, there was a final presentation ceremony, which was part of the um, uh, sort of gala dinner at this uh, agriculture conference, which uh, took place in Rhodes last month. So there was over a thousand people at that conference. So it's quite a high profile event and quite a high profile thing for the students. Um, and we found that the students gave a lot of very positive feedback about the experience um, and the industry were also very interested about the way in which it, it had engaged both industry and academia. Um, and this particular one was really oriented towards um, uh, giving academics it, or at sort of research students insights into the business process. Um, but a similar kind of uh, thing could be developed uh, in the future for other areas. Um, so it's always a problem jumping to the next slide. How are we doing on time? <laughs> right. Okay, so that's the present. Um, going forward, the um, question is really if, if we were going to sort of reconstruct education. Um, no, where, where would we where would we take it? Um, what would it look like if we were to sort of reformulate it? Um, and uh, it might look quite different to what we have at the moment. Um, and uh, the kind of key areas that uh, you know I've been thinking about really are that it's it's about materials, about teaching materials, and we heard this morning about how libraries far from becoming redundant in terms of um, uh, academic teaching actually becoming gradually more important. Uh, and I'll say more about materials in a minute. There's the kind of the whole social thing about, um, you know, how do you create a learning environment and, and a social space. There's the mentoring and the tutoring aspects. And then there's the kind of uh, assessment and accreditation. Um, do these all have to be done by the same people in the same place, in the same way, etc.? Uh, and I think that you know, there's, we're starting to see perhaps some, some fragmentation in, in these areas and maybe then some reconfiguration. So that's the first thought. Um, in my own teaching, um, I'm beginning increasingly to use, uh, you know, I, I very much admired um, sort of people who put together their own videos and put together their own materials, but it's, it's very labour intensive as we heard, it takes a lot of time. Um, and the fact is how many uh, sort of video lessons do you need in a certain subject area? Um, so for instance, one of the, the courses I teach is in um, aquaculture business, and I don't have uh, a background in economics, um, but I have to teach just a little bit of economics to give the right kind of context uh, for some, some of the things in aquaculture that I teach. Um, and so I find that the, the uh, students all far more appreciate uh, young Jodie here than uh, me because not only is she uh, far more expert in, in economics than I am, um, but also uh, far better looking. So, uh, so, you know, we can make use of material that's out there already. And, um, you know, I think one of the things we maybe need to do a little bit is, is sort of relax a bit on the, on the production of materials for uh, teaching. There's so much becoming available um, and so much sharing going on that... Uh, no, it's, it's a very exciting field. Um, okay, so another thing is, um, going back a little bit to the pedagogy, just, just what is learning, what are we trying to do in the courses that we uh, run? Uh, and um, I was reading one definition which said that basically learning is about changing behaviour. If, if it doesn't result in a change of behaviour, it's not real learning. Open for discussion. Um, what's, um, what's most valued by employers for sure is not necessarily what you know but what you can do as a result of that knowledge so employers don't necessarily need, want to, to know that you can um, that you know all about sort of different things it's, it's about what you can do uh, and how you can interact in the workplace and what contribution you can make in the workplace um, certainly went to at least one lecture by um, somebody from the industry who, who said to our, a group of our students, you know, well, real learning is what happens when you're outside the classroom. Had a fairly poor view of, of the classroom experience in general. 
And certainly we all know that we learn far more and certainly far more deeply from experience than uh, from somebody else telling us something. Um, so I always start at necessarily the right end um, in terms of uh, you know, the teaching. You know, I, I, I come from a, a topic and a subject-based background, um, but is that, is that the right place to start, you know, teaching you what I know, teaching the students what I know? Should it far more be what do the students want to achieve, how can we help them to achieve them through uh, the knowledge that we have? Um, so one of the people, I, if you haven't already met her and I wanted to introduce you to, was um, Jane Hart in the Centre for Learning and Performance Technologies. Many of you may already be familiar with her. She's a very uh, prolific blogger and um, tweet, Twitterer, tweeter. Um, and the area that she's working in is different to the area that we're working in in, in higher education. Um, but nevertheless, uh, she writes a lot about um, uh, adult learning, essentially, and uh, a lot about adult learning in the workplace. And I think that's very relevant to those of us who are sort of working at the higher end of, a, of a higher education and looking at uh, the courses that we offer in terms of lifelong learning. Um, and you can see that uh, this is kind of her perceptions of um, sort of way, way learning goes on and um, most of learning, the bigger proportion of learning is certainly outside of the formal context um, but and mostly within the, the workplace. Uh, I guess this, this uh, ignores uh, leisure learning to some extent. Um, and she's kind of worked out a number of different stages in terms of um, the development of, of, of the comp some of the ideas that she's dealing with. Um, and um, very pleasingly, uh, she's put blended learning, i.e. the mix of online and face-to-face, -face, uh, as, as a development from e-learning. So perhaps I wasn't cheating quite so much when we, when we did our back course with the Bangladesh, but actually we were getting into what is now becoming um, far more of a focus, I think, uh, at policy level, uh, blended learning. Um, and I'm getting particularly interested in the kind of um, the, the, the informal learning domain um, because so much of what actually goes on when you really kind of look at what's happening in the way that students interact, where they're learning from, how they're learning, uh, the order in which they learn, it's, it's all, a lot of it is, is more linked with the informal processes uh, than the formal. And indeed, if I look at these definitions and say, you know, how do I learn? Um, it's, it's mostly the informal learning. And indeed, the whole research process that many of us are engaged with, uh, going out, trying to, to solve problems, um, finding knowledge when we need it, is the informal approach. Um, so what we kind of have is that... Uh, as, as teachers, we're often trying to go down the push route of, um, you know, this is the knowledge, here you are, you know, fill you up with it. Uh, this is then how you should use it and can use it. Um, whereas the way that most of us actually work is more going in the opposite direction in terms of starting off with problems, starting off with, with, with interests, uh, things that we want to find out about, and then we're using these kind of learning methods and technologies uh, to, to kind of develop and, 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 and find the knowledge. So um, this kind of interaction I find, find very interesting, and this is what I mean by you know, sort of questions and issues for the future. Um, you know, do we best serve our students by packaging up the learning and the knowledge for them, or should we be trying to set them free to make use of this you know, fantastic resource of the internet that's being more guides and mentors. Um, and I'm practically finished. <laughs> On our own domain, what I'm finding increasingly important is the, um, the, the networking that goes on in terms of communities of interest or uh, whatever through the social networks and how we interact with those now I think is a, is a big challenge for, the, um, for academia as well and for the way in which we, we're learning. And that's the, the last of uh, Jane's slides where she's moved on from stage three to stage four and stage five and saying how do we work through uh, with social learning and with um, collaborative learning. So um, 
I'll leave you with those. Uh, I think that's the end of the thing. I'll leave you with those uh, ideas. And uh, if we have any minutes left, we can uh, ask questions and, uh, and ask, ask those discussions. So, so that one's just to advertise the, the projects so that uh, we can get the brownie <coughs> points on the EC. Mm -hmm. oh, the EC projects. <laughs>